first of all, I just want to uh, take a minute to say what's up and appreciate everybody stopping by. We're going to make um, a concerted effort to try to do more on our Discord. Um, watch parties that I'm going to be attending whenever possible. Game nights. Um, just giveaways, AMAs with players. Anytime something of any consequence happens or whatever, I'm going to try to hop on here and do these. So they're a much more regular thing because we want you to feel um, like you're part of a genuine community. We want you to feel uh, and know that we genuinely care what you think and appreciate your support. And back in the day when we were all on IRC, <laughs> many of you probably n never been on IRC. Hey, what's up, R54? I see you, buddy. Um, we had a lot stronger community outreach. And then, you know, to be honest with you, we got so damn busy. Um, it's just been tough. Over 2020, you know, I did some streaming and YouTube content because we were all stuck at home and I had some more time. And with the re with the acquisition um, and bringing complexity home, I want to make a concerted effort, and everyone in complexity wants to make a concerted effort to make sure that um, we're doing a better job speaking to you guys and listening to you guys and explaining why we've made this decision or that decision. Um, so we hope to be able to provide you with a community that you're really excited about being a part of and can kind of be your your esports home. We know a lot of people um, have different teams that might you know be their favorites, and that's cool. There's there's a lot of really great organizations out there, but you're always welcome here, and you're always welcome to uh, hang out in our Discord and follow our socials and and be a part of our community. And if you ever come through Dallas, you have to make sure and stop and uh, see the HQ. Uh, let's see. Top question. Do you currently play any games yourself casually or competitively? Uh, sadly, the answer to that is pretty much no. I do game testing sometimes. We're looking um, at entering games. Uh, I, I play test some, some new Web3 games from time to time. But honestly, between um, complexity and my family and, and I, I don't have time. I've joked many times over the years that uh, one of the worst parts of working in the chaotic business of esports is you actually don't have time to play the games. <laughs> Kyle, uh, who's in here, and uh, and Scott and Andrew, and some of the guys on my staff and, and girls uh, do a better job of finding time to play the games. Um, but between by the time I get home and, and have some family stuff and I don't uh I don't get to play a lot of games. Over 2020 I played a lot of Valorant. Uh I had some cool guys like R54 here in the uh conversation and and N07 teaching me to play Valorant and uh my raise was super badass. No, I'm kidding. Um so I I, I played Valorant. Anytime a new game comes out like Valorant, I'll genuinely or generally put in a few hundred hours at least playing the game. So at least have some understanding of the game and some feel for the game as a player and not just a, a fan. Uh, but then I usually run out of time. Uh, Frank Tastic. Oh, and thanks coach Kona for the question. I appreciate it. Frank Tastic. You might not travel as much as a CS team, but it, sh <laughs> it sure seems like it sometimes. What are your go-to travel essentials that you can't be without? Um, yeah, I've definitely spent a lot of time on planes in the last five years. Um, I don't mind traveling, but it certainly disrupts kind of the flow of your life, right? And, uh, I, it disrupts my, my family life a good bit, but it's just, um, it's just a small price. I think you have to pay in this business. I'm a big believer in being there in person whenever you can, whatever, whether it's a tournament or a meeting or whatever. And it, of course, everything has to come in balance. You can't live on the road. Um, but a lot of people, I think, try to run esports companies from their office or their home office 
98% exclusively, in, in my opinion, that's a mistake. So I've definitely packed on a lot of miles. Um, the guys in the office make fun of me for because for a few years I was concierge key on uh, American Airlines, which is uh, an invite only tier. And they do cool stuff. Like <laughs> I just flew through Heathrow a couple of days ago, and Scott Ford on my team said, Did they pick you up in the black car? Because one time I flew back from Bahrain through london at a connection and then to dallas and when i walked off the plane they met me with my name on a thing and they took me down to the tarmac and put me in a black car and drove me to my connecting flight so i didn't have to go through all the bullshit of heathrow <laughs> which was one of the coolest things that's ever happened to me in my life because if you've ever flown long distances through heathrow it is like a whole thing it's like a workout just getting through heathrow um but to answer your question um, I matter my go-to essentials. I have uh, a carry-on bag, um, and I can go to Europe for seven to ten days just on a carry-on. I go way out of my way never to check luggage. Uh, it's just a nightmare. Of course, when I travel with my wife and my daughter, I we we check luggage. But when I travel for work, um, I never check luggage. And I have a, a black Tumi. Oh, hold on, it's over here. It's my go bag. So you know. I got to keep it close to me. This is what I call my go bag. I had another one for years um, and it was falling apart. So my wife said, I'm taking them all and getting a go bag. And it's got my initials right here. So I think it's, it's kind of cool. And this thing has everything you can imagine from like medicines and uh, every cord you can imagine, um, reading materials currently in here is called the slight edge um gerald from lenovo legion recommended i read that and i got a magazine in here that i get each month um got noise canceling headset for if i get in loud places and this is always ready to go passport gum like you name it and this this is what i call my go bag there was one time uh, i've told the story before where I decided to fly to uh, Helsinki to uh, recruit Alexi B on about an hour's notice. And Scott Ford drove me home and I threw a bunch of clothes in my carry-on bag and I just grabbed my go bag because this thing is always ready to go to the airport. <laughs> oh, this was when I was concierge key. This is a name tag. I don't know how well you could see it. Made out of a piece of an airplane. So this was a Boeing 767, and it has the tail number and stuff on there. Um, it entered service. I'm trying to read it here. In 1968? No, 1988. And they retired the plane April 20, 2017. And they took the medal, and they made these special uh, American Airlines tags for the concierge key. I'm not currently concierge key because I didn't travel as much the last two years, but I have a suspicion by the end of the year I will be. So those are my travel <clears throat> piece of advice. Learn how to pack well and travel just with a carry-on and always have a go bag ready. That's a cool question. People are probably like, why the hell is he talking about travel bags? But this is very much meant to just kind of be a chill family fireside, hang out, ask whatever the heck you want. Um, that's what our Discord is, where we chill, where we hang out. And uh, yeah, so it's going to be really chill. If you got stuff to do, I don't blame you if you have to take off. All right. Thanks, Fantastic King Tom 1, what game are you personally most passionate about uh, besides CS, obviously? Any game that we're in at the time. Um, one thing I feel bad about is because we've been in Counter-Strike for so long, I obviously am super passionate about it and pay a lot of attention to it. And I don't give enough voice and I don't give enough attention to all the other awesome games that we've been in over the years. And uh, right now, our Rocket League team is uh, doing Media Day over in Copenhagen again. Copenhagen is like the center of the esports universe lately. Um Rocket League and all the other games we're in from Apex and, and FIFA and Madden and you know Valorant we've been in over the years and we just we're in a lot of different games at any one time and we've been in dozens of professional games over the years and I just love competitive gaming. Um, I my pulse gets damn near as high for you know a three v three Rocket League overtime as it does in a one v one in Counter Strike. Um, yeah, that's a great question. 
But uh, other than Counter-Strike, I can't say like, hey, this game is my favorite. I'll have four different games on our teams playing or even other teams um, at any one time. We'll be watching Halo and be watching Warzone. And I just love competitive gaming. I like watching really skilled and talented people do their thing. Thanks, uh, King Tom One. Fantastic, another one. <clears throat> What can fans do more of to show the brands that we're here, we're excited, ready to support complexity into the future? <laughs> that is such a cool question. Thank you. Um, I alluded to this a little bit in the Richard Lewis interview. Um, just interacting. There's obvious ones, right? Like if you if you have the means, buy some merch, um, buy buy things that we put up for sale. But just as important, honestly. It's just interacting, liking the tweets, replying to the tweets, you know, going on Insta, following our different accounts. We now have different Twitters for, for Counter-Strike and, and, and other games in addition to the main. And the same on, on Insta. We have specialized YouTube channels. Um, you can find those things, you know, through our website and, and go to the different platforms, follow them, comment, because those things help the algorithm. And the more interaction we have and the more we can grow the platforms, um, you know, the larger the organization gets, and quite honestly, um, the more we're, be, we're able to drive sponsor revenue because passionate fan bases um, are very, very important in, in any kind of business like ours or sport or anything else. Uh, so even if, if you're not really in a position to, to spend dollars buying things, Come hang out on the Discord, like the tweets, retweet, interact, follow the players, encourage the players, cheer for the players in the chat. Go on Reddit and put the complexity um, tag if it's available on your name when you're commenting on Reddit, but be cool on Reddit. <laughs> Just interact and show people that you care and uh, use your social platform to help amplify and engage with ours. Chill in Discord. Just hang out. Um, that stuff goes a really, really long way. So great question. Flavored toothpicks, yay or nay? For years, um, I had this special oil. It was a very hot cinnamon oil. I would dip my toothpicks in, and it would burn the skin off your lips if you had too much of that stuff on the toothpick. So I love flavored toothpicks. Um, but the last probably five years, I go with these things. I don't know if that's focusing in i don't know if they're they're called slim you dent and you just open them up and there's a pack of them and people tell you i've always got one in my mouth it's like my nervous habit i have to be doing something so i'll always have a toothpick so i have these in like my back pocket everywhere i go and i keep extra ones in my go bag so i like toothpicks flavored or unflavored but i found it's easier to just do the unflavored very cool unique questions Coach Kona, how can how can we make player, coach, and team performance support seen as more of a necessity and less of a luxury in esports? Um, I think that's a great question. It's something if you followed us that we're very passionate about. Um, it's really about studying what is next for player performance and player care and mental health care and. We pay attention to our living situations of our players. We try, whenever possible, not to jam, jam them in the team house. We we pay as much attention and teach them as best we can about diet, um, about uh, using the right furniture. Like you know, everyone knows we've had these uh, complexity Herman Millers. Um, not an ad, by the way, because they don't uh, support us anymore. But we do love the product. That's just honest. It's an embody chair um, for really having the proper spinal alignment and things like that. We've, we've gone to great lengths to try to improve our performance care and player care. Um, mental health has always been something we're very passionate about. Um, so how do we see that as more of a necessity? That's a great question. And obviously we're most specifically concerned about our players, but we try to set an example as an industry leader in, in how these things should be done. And I think the trend over the last four years has really been towards uh, paying much more attention to these things. Thankfully, mental coaches and mental health has really um, had a lot brighter spotlight put on it in recent years. Uh, so I think the way that we can, um, 
share that that it is a necessity in in this industry is just by setting that example. Royal, what's up? What do you think? More game developers and tournament organizers at large who run esports, Riot, Ubisoft, Blizzard, Valve, can do to assist in making the industry more sustainable. May, obviously, the major stickers are a huge revenue driver for teams. We've seen countless times where they're failing to make a major simply means organizations no longer have the financial means to continue operating. Correct. Riot has recently implemented similar revenue share systems and um, as Ubisoft's pilot program, and it's a great step in the right direction. Just curious on your thoughts. Um, edit, amazing to see you back at the helm of complexity. Thank you. Uh, can't wait to see what, what the future brings the team. Much love. Great question, Loyal, and I've been pounding on this drum for many years. Um, I'm a strong believer that that the uh, developers need to figure out ways to properly share revenue streams because esports is more than a marketing instrument. I really think it creates communities that continue to invest in your game and play your game for years and years. And the easiest way um, for them to do that is, is figuring out intelligent ways to share in-game digital items um, with the different professional teams and, and players. And we've seen that with Counter-Strike stickers, and that's been wonderful. Obviously, they are based around the major. So like you said, if you don't make the major, it's not beneficial. It's um, problematic. Uh, we... If you watch some of the Valorant Championship recently and the quote unquote, you know, the Send bundle, the, the Sentinels were pushing their bundle hard where they're selling team bundles in game. Absolutely love that idea. Working with the teams and the players to get their intellectual property inside the game and then sharing those revenues, it gives developers another um, product they can sell in game to make themselves more money. And they can also, um, you know, leverage that team IP uh, to help the teams be more financially sustainable over a long period of time. Obviously, it's a great question. You could probably do an entire podcast for sure just on this question. Um, but I think developers need to be more intentional about those in-game revenues. We even just recently saw how um, Riot's LCS is pivoting uh, a bit from a sponsorship revenue share um, more to an in-game digital IP revenue share. And I think that was a wonderful move that should have happened six years ago. Um, but hey, it's uh, better late than never. Anytime the developers can create a win-win where they have more items to sell in their game means they make more money. And when those items are team IP based, the teams make more money. The players make more money. The staffs that work for the teams, you know, they're getting their health care and, and people have travel budgets for, for their professional players and mental health programs and financial wellness programs. And it's a win-win all the way around. So I'm a huge proponent of, of developers seeing a bigger picture and uh, helping create products that can drive revenue via in-game IP. King Tom won. A lot of questions. Thanks, buddy. Do you think the future of esports will lay in the current large titles or in newer upcoming esports? Also, are there any titles you are interested to expand into in complexity? Uh, we're always looking at new titles. Absolutely. Um, I was just in a conversation a couple minutes ago about a potential new title for complexity. So we're always looking. And I think it's a pretty easy answer. The future esports um, will lay in both. It'll lay in the current large titles. Some will fade away, as they always have. Um, but look how long Counter Strike's been around. Dota and uh, you know StarCraft, and now even League of Legends has been around a long time, right? Um, so there's going to be some games that really stand the test of time a little bit more than others, and there will be games that we've never heard of yet that will come up. Um, like Fortnite just came out of nowhere. It was a massive global, um, you know, esports and gaming product. And, uh, you know, even Valorant um, really kind of came out of nowhere. I don't I don't think the general public knew that was under development until pretty late in its um, development cycle. So there will 100% be new games. I'm incredibly um, interested in some of the Web3 games that are being developed. Um, you know, there's there's different games coming out like Shrapnel. Doctor Disrespect's got a game. You got Farcana um, coming coming out of the Middle East region. You've got um, and I always say this wrong. A Neon N Y A N Neon Neon um, Heroes game. 
that uh, we were just playing the other day. It's cats and mech suits, kind of like an Overwatch vibe. And then when your mech gets wrecked, you're like a cat running around. <laughs> it's in the Epic Game Store. It looks pretty badass. Um, but I'm really interested in some of these games. A, because I'm always interested in new games that are coming out. But B, I, I want to see how their in-game economic systems grow and develop. And I, I'm a big believer in ownership and digital ip i think if you buy a sticker you should own that sticker and be able to sell that sticker very easily on an open market if you buy a weapon scan or whatever that is i believe you should own that um that's a, again a whole other podcast but that is one reason i i follow that universe um pretty closely and long term i'm a big believer in it Smokey the clown brother you have been a you have been with us for so long thank you for uh being loyal all these years and you got four questions let me get through these here bud number one how do the experience of securing your ownership of the complexity branding differ both the terms logistically and importance to you between cgs and the most recent game score deal uh, was one particularly more stressful or critical in your eyes. Well, they were both critical, or we wouldn't be having this conversation. Sorry, I need my, my co midday coffee. Coffee number three today. Um, in terms of which one was more, more difficult, by far, in a way, the one that just took place was. Uh, as I shared a little bit on uh, the Richard Lewis YouTube interview a couple weeks ago, it was very, very difficult. Um, it, was, it was very difficult. And if, if I'm honest with me and if I'm honest with you, like, uh, still recovering from it, <laughs> still recovering from it. It was, it was four, four plus, um, straight months of nonstop. It was, it was difficult. The CGS time frame was incredibly difficult because I'd moved my family from Atlanta to California and then they closed the league like six months later. Um, that was very difficult personally, but the acquisition of the complexity IP was very simple. It was a few phone calls, um, some basic paperwork and a thousand bucks. And I bought the IP back. Um, whereas this was obviously far, far more complicated under a very compressed and stressful, um, time frame. And I've said it already and I'll say it again without, uh, my complexity fam and, uh, you know, Kyle Bautista in, in particular, there's no way in heck, uh, we got that done at time. So it was, it was much more difficult, but in terms of which was more critical, I think they're both critical. Um, you could argue now that we have a lot more in the line, a lot more people, you know, their jobs rely on this and it's a, it's a bigger operation, but yeah, they were, they were definitely both critical. Number two, how does buying out complexity affect your vision and goals for the remainder of 2024 and into calendar year 25? Man, such good questions. I should have had more coffee. Buying complexity back. <clears throat> Everyone in the office, Smokey, since we're, we're so excited. We're so happy. Um, and this isn't to put down anyone in the previous situation or, or whatever. But when you get into different corporate structures, Sometimes you can have less flexibility and it could take a long time to, to get things done because there's all these levels of approval and quite often these people are in different cities and then you got legal approval, marketing approval, and budget approval. And I think you see that in, in any corporate structure. Sometimes the bigger things get, um, the slower things get, and you have less ability to affect change. With this acquisition, we are now back to much more of uh, old school mentality. And I've said this recently. We're like, we could come up with an idea for complexity retro t-shirts at 9 a.m. And we can have it in the store by 10 a.m. And that, I think, is what me and my team and the, and, the, and the family over at the Complexity HQ really like. We like being nimble. We like um, having freedom and flexibility to try cool stuff without six layers of approval. We like um, being able to be like, hey, you know what? I'm doing uh, an AMA today. <laughs> and it, someone aptly noted, you probably want to give a couple days to get some more people in there. I'm like, you're right. That would be the smart thing to do. But we're just doing it two hours because I want the people that are on Discord and, and the people that are hanging out with us. 
um, to just be kind of in the front row. So we do have some really cool plans. My job um, could be really all over the place. One day I'm cheering for Counter-Strike. Next day I'm meeting with corporate investors. The next day I'm trying to sell a sponsorship. The next day we're dealing with HR things. The next day we're doing budgeting. It's all over the place, which I love. It, it can feel a little overwhelming some days, but um, I think the folks in the complexity office, we're so excited to be back doing things the way we want to do them and being able to really be creative and just get after it and kind of chart our own destiny, chart our course. Um, so yeah, it, it's a great question. In terms of visions and, and, and goals, we're still building a lot of that stuff out, but uh, we want to build a long-term sustainable business that has just this compelling community where people really genuinely have fun working with us and following us. And of course, at the end of the day, the goal is always to hoist trophies. In this business, that can be a tricky thing because without salary caps, if you're willing to spend enough money, you're almost guaranteed to hoist trophies. Um, but what I love about us is we run a sustainable business and always manage to be competitive while almost never having the biggest budgets in any game. And I think that says a lot about the people that work for us. Um, we're not just throwing suitcases of cash and waiting for trophies to, to come around. Uh, we like developing players, identifying up and coming players, and then coaching them and, and building them into far outperforming um, where they would be otherwise. Okay, number three, back in the day, we had random little things like community deathmatch nights, DM nights, where the players would hop in in different servers. Any thoughts of doing some of those, maybe? Um, some gun games, 100%. We want to do community game nights. Obviously, um, with our pro schedules, the, the bigger the business gets, sadly, the less time the pros have. <laughs> I think our Counter-Strike team has been traveling abroad and living in hotels something like 70 out of the last 80 days or something. It's insane. Um, and there's always the next tournament, right? And it's like, so getting some of the pros that we know you'd love to play with is tricky, but we're, we're going to do our very best, um, even if it's only a few hours here and there. Uh, but we definitely want to do um, community nights and deathmatch nights and, and things like that. Absolutely. Number four, will the Complexity Forums ever make a return? <laughs> we miss Cole One's news post of the day. Haha, <laughs> just kidding. Oh, my gosh. That's a throwback. Back in the early days of esports, the Complexity Forums were like Reddit is now almost. We're like, everyone hung out on our forums. And I would just find interesting news from that day and just like post it in like the off-topic forum for the hell of it. Man, you have a good memory. No, I don't think complexity forums will ever be like that again. But man, it was a really special time in, in history. But uh, I would like Discord to be something like that where we all hang out. Um, and obviously, it really means a lot to us when you follow and, and interact with our social posts. Dude, you purchased those retro tees immediately. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time and bring me the pistols. There you go. Slicks, Slixer, Slixers, I, don't, I hope I'm saying that right. Do you have any more plans for the CS rosters, like Academy or that sort of thing? I would love to have Academy teams. The problem is to do them right. It, it's expensive. Even if the players aren't making really large salaries, you need support staff and things need to be operated at a high level. Um, that is one of those things I would love to do. Um, but in terms of running a sustainable business, I think that it's challenging. EG recently tried something like that, and you know, it, it's just very challenging to do. Is anything going to happen with the current logo? Great question. Um, it's still undecided. We're a few weeks in from the acquisition, and it's been pretty nuts. 
we had we had a Halo major, we qualified for a Counter Strike major, and I was in Copenhagen, and the Rocket League majors going on, and Apex is now in their major. It's just been crazy. Um, but I would say, don't hold me to this. I would say it's probably at least eighty percent sure that we're going to roll back to the red and black. Um, in some form of the old logo. I want a modernized version where if people see it, they'll know what it is, but not the exact old logo with the aspect ratio all messed up. And that's going to take time. It's going to take time to, to have design, to really have you know, thoughtful time to, to do it. Um, and we have sponsors that are aligned with this logo and this IP. Our whole headquarters is all this and blue and black and people are like oh just swap the logo believe me i wish it was that easy but it's probably a 12 plus month process um so we will we'll be sporting this for at least 2024 but i think most most the uh, most of the complexity fam at the hq we're, we're pretty aligned we'd like to go back to the old look we just need to do it right and not rush into it Okay, how was my stay in Europe? Um, it was it was good. It was really good to be at an event with the guys. I really enjoy being at the events with the players and, and talking to them and trying to do what I can to share whatever wisdom I've gained over 20 years of gaming to try to help them and cheer for them. And, and then I get to see all my friends in the Counter-Strike community. Um, there's, there's a whole kind of family that makes Counter-Strike happen and that, that travels around the world, so it was really good to see them. It was super stressful. Uh, like I said, I wasn't sleeping well. Um, <laughs> I did an interview with HLTV after the guys got knocked out of the tournament by phase. And I was so tired and just completely drained. I, I was so completely drained. I hope that interview um, comes out okay. <laughs> You're going to see me at my low like just completely out of it in that interview i think they're going to run it after the after the major but it overall super positive i love being with the, with the team and and the staff on site and uh being able to cheer and being able to high five them after after a win um yeah it it, it was overall good i was just kind of very very exhausted really appreciate you hanging out um with Valve forcing an end to partner invites for tournaments in CS2, how do you think this will affect revenue for esports organizations? Negatively. Um, I understand why Valve didn't want like guaranteed slots and they want the game to be aspirational, and I respect that. In my personal opinion, they should have left more of the economic side alone because the, the leagues and the teams had worked really hard together to build products where everyone could win. And there's revenue share, and it was becoming a sustainable kind of part of the Counter Strike ecosystem. And then they just dropped the nuke on it. Um, very disappointing. Do you think it will lead to smaller orgs getting more money or the tournament organizers keeping more revenue? Um, in my opinion, it'll lead to the tournament organizers keeping more revenue. But we'll see. There's a lot of smart people trying to trying to work on that. Dopey Eker, what's up, dude? Good to see some of the old school names in here. Do you think there's a business opportunity in looking into bringing some of the great uh, North American players from 1.6 in source and, uh, and having a fun tournament event around those players for charity? This could create an opportunity to capture some older fans from that era and introduce them to CS2. Um, I think it's a really awesome idea. Do I think it's a business opportunity? Events are expensive. You got tra you got flights, you got hotels, you got production, you got equipment, you got insurance. Um, this Counter-Strike thing that we were uh, kind of looking at doing right before GMAC, just to give you an idea for a small event, just a time, you know, just a few teams in our headquarters, um, online qualifiers, you're talking a hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollars. So Unless you had all those 1.6 um, and source players kind of together in a, in a place or there was one big sponsor behind it, um, from a business opportunity, it, it would be it would be tough. Now, from a charitable opportunity, if there was something, you know, you could go to Extra Life or something and do some 
you know, and drive charitable dollars, that's a different, different conversation. But in terms of a business opportunity, um, it's a great idea, but it'd be tough to do. Low- Lowerson 111. Hi, Mr. Lake. Sorry for essay posting. I value your knowledge. Thank you. Number one, who was the first player you acquired that you knew was special, going to be special? Warden was the first professional gamer I hired. Matt Warden Dickens. And he's still around the ecosystem now. Number two, Counter-Strike is one of the few esports that capture the peak of cyber sport video games that have cognitive strategic depth on the level of athletic sport. Yep. And cognitive sport. Yep. Like chess. Yes. What newer esports do you think will reach that echelon of competitive design? Man, these are like really good questions. Like you're like journalists and I'm <laughs> doing like a written interview. Um That is such a good question. What newer, I guess it depends how you define newer esports. See, to me, Valorant is still a newer esport. <laughs> I guess it's already been out four years. When you get old like me, four years, like, ch- and then you throw in the pandemic. It's like, does anyone feel like it's been four years since 2020? Like, really? Four years ago that happened? Um, I think Valorant has some of that aspect um, to it that Counter Strike has in terms of not only are you playing a Twitch reaction shooter, where, but you're also playing chess with your economy and and what what players on your team have different utility, different rounds, and things like that. But I don't know if Valorant's necessarily a newer esport. It's a good question. Nothing comes to mind right off the top of my head. I want to keep moving. Have you ever read the Inner Game of Tennis? It's enlightening um, on learning the process. I have not read that. I read a lot too. Um, whenever I get any kind of quiet time to myself, which is pretty rare, usually on airplanes, I read. You guys can't see it, but I have two big bookshelves on either side here that are chock full of books to the ceiling. When did you know Counter-Strike was special? Um, It only took me a couple weeks of of playing the game. And then when I discovered that there were already tournaments and stuff, it was a light bulb moment. I knew it real quick just because I loved it so much. I could see the potential. What were the factors that fed into your decision to buy back complexity? And how did you feel at the time? Um, you know, complexity is my third child. <laughs> I have Allie, Jordan, and complexity. And complexity means much more than just a business to many people that I care about um, and, and are close to that, that have spent years and years and years of their lives um, helping build this complexity dream. So it wasn't even uh, it wasn't really even a choice. Once Game Square said, "Hey, uh, we're we're going to buy Phase," we said, "Well, that's going to be a problem." And they said, "Oh, it'll be all right." <laughs> but it quickly became apparent to everyone, "Yeah, that's a problem." Um, so they said, "Well, let's sit down and figure it out." And to their credit, when I said sell it back to me, they were like, "Okay, let's let's make it happen." And they worked hard to make it happen. I'm grateful for that. Um, but no, I don't think there is. I mean, there was definitely days when I'm in the middle of M&A hell where I'm like, what? why am I doing? Why am I doing that? It's just out of exhaustion and frustration. You know what I mean? You ever get there? Um, but in my lucid moments where I wasn't just coming unglued, there was never a question about buyback complexity for sure. Um, oh, my goodness. Number six. Super long question. Uh, I'm just reading this to myself. What does my decision-making process look like in business? Man, that's a really good question. I'm on, for anyone who could scroll up, I'm on number six six of Larson 111. It's a really good question. I don't think I have time to really get into that deep of question. Um, But I do make different risk-based gut decisions. I think anytime you're trying to build something, especially if you're in a leadership or ownership position, you have to be really um, open to alternate opinions. And it's a bit of a, it's a bit of an art form, not a science. Because you have to be the leader. You have to call the ball. 
only one person should be driving the bus. If a bunch of people have their hands on it, it's going to go in the ditch. If a bunch of chefs are trying to work on the same dish, it's going to taste like shit. So you, you have to make the decision. But if you if you surround yourself with yes people who are always just cheering and telling you you're brilliant, you're going to fail. So you need people that are genuine around you that are that are willing to say, hey, I think you're wrong here. And then you listen to all sides and all opinions, but, and then you make that decision. And I think that just comes from trying to stay humble, um, trying to grow in wisdom and experience. And then I think when you need to make those gut calls, if you've been humble and grown in wisdom, your gut is going to be more accurate. And you have to understand that on on the on the weekly, if not the daily, that you're gonna make mis- mistakes, and and how you let that impact you, mentally and emotionally, and whether you become cynical or negative and pessimistic, these are very important things, and you have to really make sure that overall you're staying optimistic, not blind optimism, but an optimism that that understands. Everything's not going to go perfectly. You're going to make mistakes. Things are going to go wrong. But your belief in yourself and your belief in the people around you, you know that you can overcome the obstacles and kind of um, get through whatever life throws at you. I don't know if that exactly answered your question, but what advice would I give to your early 20 self? Um to my early 20s self, I would have told myself to stop drinking. <laughs> I drank way too much when I was that age and beyond. I haven't drank in over a decade now, and it's one of the best decisions I ever made. I know that's not probably where you were going with that. You were probably thinking more business. Um, that's what I would have told myself. What is the most important thing I learned last year? Good Lord last year most important thing I learned last year was that if you say your prayers and you trust in God and just do your best and you're patient good things will happen that's what that's what I learned last year because there was a point last year um Well, I pretty much decided I was going to move on and do something else. And uh, next thing you know, after five months of chaos, um, I'm I'm back in and running complexity with my friends. So, uh, yeah, I make I make no uh, I don't make it a secret that I'm a Christian, and uh, I definitely have my daily prayer time. And there were a couple of tough years where I was like, God, I'm just trusting it with this and I'm just going to do my best and stay positive and, and see what you want to do here. And now here we are. So yeah, that's what I learned last year. If I was valve, what would I do to grow counter-strike to the level like sports, like soccer, man, these questions are so good. How do you heck did you guys come up with so many questions so fast? I'm going to bore the hell out of everybody in here. (laughs) <laughs> so many of these questions. Man, if I was Valve, um that that is a that is a whole podcast. But I, I do think they need to focus more on on trying to help the teams and therefore the players economically beyond one major or maybe two majors a year. What did you and what did you and Elite discuss during the signing process? Um not much. I, I knew um, I wanted him to play for us. We talked about kind of the team and, and what things would look like. And and uh, he wanted to play for us. It, it was it, it was an easy uh, matchmaking process, you could say. And uh, I think the best of him. He was super down and really hard on himself after we uh, kind of – we lost to Vitality – and he felt tremendously responsible for that because he didn't have his normal, like, insane game. <laughs> um, he's such he's such a good person, and I was just trying to tell him, like, it's good for you to see we can compete with com- vitality even if you have an off day. It's not fair to you 
to have to always be Superman and always have these insane stats and always carry this team. Um, and you had, for you, a very off day, and we were still neck and neck double overtime with Vitality. Um, he's, he's a good dude. Patty Slay, for fans in the DFW area, are there any plans for future collaborations with local sports teams similar to the event in Frisco Rough Riders? Are there plans to have more events at the HQ, watch parties, lands, etc.? To the best of my knowledge, we don't have any immediately scheduled plans with local sports teams, but I'm sure we'll be doing stuff like we did with Rough Riders. And we absolutely uh, will be announcing watch parties and things um, at the headquarters for sure. Okay. Freaky. Thank you for everything you do for e NA Esports. Appreciate that. Has Complexity ever thought of exploring PUBG Esports? Yes. Jeff, is there any more news on the potential CS2 LAN? Great question again, Jeff. Um, so here's the deal with CS2 LAN. And I'm just being like super honest and transparent with you guys. If you haven't, if you, if you couldn't tell, I told you this is going to be like a family meeting, like family, family uh, fireside. We really want to do it. But like I alluded to earlier, something like this costs over 150, maybe 200 gram. And we haven't found a lead sponsor for the event yet. And if we can't find a lead sponsor, I have to make a very difficult decision. Are we going to eat 150 to 200 grand to hold the event? Or are we going to postpone it till maybe the end of the year or something like that? Um, that decision hasn't been made, but we only have a few days to make it. We really want to do it. But we're also trying to run a sustainable business. We just bought the company back and it's... Yeah. So the CS event in June is up in the air. If you have any friends that work at... Uh, Esports sponsors, toss them, uh, toss them my Twitter handle. Connor, have you ever, have you considered implementing any engagement based audience reward or revenue sharing systems? Example, dis distributing Web3 tokens to Twitch viewers for hours watched. Um, yes, similar to Liquid Plus, yes. So the answer to this is absolutely. Um, we're evaluating what kind of fan programs might make sense. Um, how can we reward fans? I've been asked a couple times in the last couple of weeks. Um, the most recent question stuck out to me. Would I ever consider like a Packers type of ownership, meaning allowing fans of the organization to buy some type of equity or token or whatever to have ownership in the organization? And the answer is yes, I would. I haven't had any time to really do proper homework to see how feasible that would be. How would something like that work, whether it's a fan program or I don't know, but the quick answer is, um, have I considered it? Would I consider it? The answer is yes. I think it'd be really cool to have a Packers type of organization where the fans own the organization, but uh, we're an American company and there's a, sec and there's there's a lot of legalities around different things um but it's very very intriguing to me <laughs> super ghost where's the darn red tie <laughs> so here's a funny story um when i flew over to copenhagen for the major like i said i only travel with a carry-on and i figured i was going to be there a week and then scott ford's like hey i got the uh I got the throwback jerseys we we're going to surprise the team with. And we posted that on our social medias. They didn't know I was bringing over the uh, throwback jerseys. And then, you know, Scott and his team had them ready for sale and everything. Um, you know, Scott Cole and his social team, everything was all set up. So we recorded me giving them the jerseys, yada, yada, yada. That's a long way of saying I didn't have enough room in my suitcase to take the, uh, I call it the bat suit. <laughs> White shirt, red tie, black pants, black shoes. But what I told the team was, if you qualify for the arena, I was going to change my return ticket, and I was going to stay another week in Copenhagen and watch them in the arena. I was going to literally go to the mall and buy a new shirt, a red tie, <laughs> new red, black shoes. New, I was going to buy the whole bat suit at the Copenhagen Mall. Um, unfortunately, we didn't make the arena. But, uh, yeah, it's like, these damn jerseys of yours cost me uh, the bat suit, and now i got to go to the mall and buy this whole outfit. <laughs> but... It wasn't meant to be this time. Willie Wood. Okay, Willie. I saw this question earlier. Um, I'm a Willie Wood's question. 
at 1257 Central. It's pretty long. As someone who does financial asset cycle analysis, I'm worried we're headed into another global financial crisis. Uh, I think there's reason to have that worry. Not in the immediate future, da, da, da. it's contingent on an 18.60 real estate cycle. I know it may sound ridiculous or out of left field. However, you could take me my word, 2008 plus 18.6 years is 2026. 20, so you're talking about cycles. You're studying economic professors. Have I heard anything like this cycle analysis? Um, when I saw you post this question, I reached over to my handy bookshelf and I grabbed a book that I read recently. And it's a little dusty. The Changing World Order by Ray Dalio. And if you saw uh, my Twitter feed when I was in Riyadh last October, I actually met this guy. And I never fanboy, but I'm like, I got to get a picture with Ray. So I hung out with Ray a little bit. This is a pretty substantial book. And the whole thing is basically talking about different cycles through time. So there's like multi, there's like multi-century cycles, and in those cycles, there's a lot of other little ones. And TLDR, too long, didn't read this book. Yeah, there's there's reasonable chance in the next decade we are heading into some really tough stuff, especially in the United States. So I do study that. I do study macroeconomics. Um, and now while I like to stay optimistic, like I said earlier, I also like to be eyes wide open, and I think. Um, the next decade could be super challenging on many levels, and it's wise to be ready for you and your loved ones on, on different levels of life. How prepared would Complexity Org be for such a downturn? Um, not as prepared as I would like, right? If there's a global economic crash or, or huge cyclical uh, macroeconomic troubles, uh, I think everyone is in, in trouble. Um, and then three, how prepared do you think the entire CS scene is for such an event? Same thing. I don't think esports is. We're already struggling in esports, so I think to uh, to add a global macro great financial crisis on top of it would not be a positive thing. Very interesting question. I saw you type it out earlier, so I grabbed uh, Dalio's book. Okay, maybe I am done. See all the chat going on here. Madman at 105. What time is it? Oh, it's almost two o'clock central. Have you thought about entering new esports? Yes. Rainbow Six Siege is a big one for you. That is a fun esport to watch. My son played that for quite a while. Um, yeah, we've looked at Rainbow Six multiple times. It's still on the radar. Those um, large team-based shooters are expensive to operate. You've got the salaries, the travel, the boot camps, the staffing. Um, but yeah, we, we always we always keep our eye on Rainbow Six. Just like I said earlier about PUBG. All right. I am just scrolling down. Spike, what's up, buddy? When did you decide uh, to reacquire complexity? Um, in October, when it became obvious that uh, our parent company was buying phase and uh, could have met the death of complexity. That's when I decided to do it. And it was mid to late October heading into Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays. So I only had a few months to pull off a large M and a deal and raise capital and everything else in the worst quarter of the year. So it was definitely a interesting time. Scott Cole, wouldn't it be crazy if my dad piloted that 767? We should look in the tail number. Oh, from my bag? Yeah. K Sareem. I'll try to wrap this up pretty pretty quick here. I know you guys are probably bored out of your minds. Hey, Bendy, what's up? Curious, as the esports industry hasn't been the most lucrative, what steps were we taking to make fans more immersed with the scene? Things like this. And and much more will have coming your way. Katie Ratio, who's um, got a SpongeBob <laughs> avatar in here, works with Scott Cole's team, and I have tasked her with community building and coming up with community building plans. Now, community is something we all take seriously at Complexity, 
um, and we all want to contribute, but we're all so damn busy doing like more specific things. Sometimes weeks go by and you haven't thought of community. So I've asked Katie to really um, put that at the top of her list and she'll be working with Scott Cole to build out more robust community interactions. Have you had discussions of partnerships with streaming platforms of some sort? Um, yes. We worked with Twitch for many years, but they've discontinued those programs. Um, I have approached Kick um, and had conversations, but obviously we're not sponsored by or working directly with Kick at this time. So yes, I have um, looked at that. In some ways, creating a fan experience we touched on You just graduated. Congratulations. I don't know why I had a question mark. Congratulations. I believe there's plenty of room for opportunity. <clears throat> what measures have been taken to market the complexity brand? Side note, I think you've been a standout CEO. Thank you. Um, yeah, really good questions. And uh, I think all I can say is just um, if you have ideas, things you want to see us doing, Definitely share them on the Discord. Um, tag Katie and, or myself or Scott Cole or or Beef. Um, we want all your opinions and thoughts on on how we can do better. And I think you're going to be seeing a lot more um, moving forward here. There's Bendy Starboy. Since you've acquired Complexity back from Game Square and Jerry, will y'all be relocating to HQ anytime soon? Great question. If you've met Jerry, I've met I have met Jerry several times. I've flown in Jerry's helicopter twice. Um, the headquarters is something we're also looking. We're we're going to be in the headquarters for at least another year, and then we're going to reevaluate. We're thinking possibly of building something else um, in this area. Uh, so that's kind of up in the air. We love the headquarters we built, but we also learned a lot building it, and we think we could do better with less money next time. And uh, we love being on the property in some ways, but in other ways, if we could get more square footage to hold larger events and things, that might be good. So that, like the logo, is definitely under consideration. All right. Did I answer the rest of the question? Oh, yes. And I have met Jerry, and he is awesome. He's always been awesome to me. He's like that really nice like uncle who has lots of really funny stories, and he's super smart and super hardworking. Um, he he was awesome to me and uh, the complexity folks, and it was an honor to have worked with work uh, with him for those years. Hey, Roger Esports, what's up, brother? Okay, I think I'm about done. Caffeine. Is there going to be a fan engagement at DreamHack Dallas 24? Oh, you're going to be there. Awesome. We were actually just having meetings about this yesterday. Um, we're not sure if we're going to have a booth, but we're definitely going to do something. Um, whether we have an official booth at DreamHack, I'm not sure. I would say probably not, um, but we definitely want to have some kind of fan engagement. Okay. Do you guys plan on investing into more content creators? And if so gaming ones or IRL streaming. Um, that's always something we're looking at. And uh, we work with lots of really great creators, both in the complexity organization. We have relationships with lots of other ones. Um, but yeah, we're always evaluating that. I wouldn't say we're actively like out um, looking to hire content creators right now. Um, we love the people we work with and uh, aren't actively seeking. What tips would I give for someone who wants to get a career in esports? It's funny. You should ask Wild, Wildy. Um, if you Google how to get a job in esports, uh, I have a video about that on on my YouTube. I think I made it in 2020. So a whole video that should help you out. Smokey the Clown. All right. I think I might be getting down to the bottom here. Any plans for getting back into Dota 2? Oh, my goodness. I... Jaito, I, I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name. Um, I won't say we have immediate plans, but it is definitely something we're interested in and have been evaluating. Uh, Dota is is a difficult game from North America, and uh, we love Dota. We've always loved Dota, but I wouldn't say we have any immediate plans for Dota. 
if I could eat one meal a day for the rest of my life, what would it be and why would it be waffles? <laughs> man, man, I actually had waffles when I was in Copenhagen at the hotel breakfast. Now I want waffles. I'm a big hot wings person. I love hot wings, but I don't think I could eat it every day, right? Ugh. I don't know what I could eat every day. I eat an apple for breakfast and an apple for lunch literally every day, and I have a normal dinner. So I guess I could eat an apple every day for the rest of my life. Is that a complexity tumbler? Oh, this? <laughs> uh, my kids got me this for Father's Day one year. Dad's the boss, right, Mom? <laughs> So this, I do a double shot of Nespresso. So basically I use two pods and, and it fits perfectly in this. So this is my Nespresso cup. Because I don't know what the size is just perfect. But yeah, my kids got me that for Father's Day. We effing love you, Jason. Thanks, Connor. <laughs> Question. What is the process like as the owner of an esports org during the dropping of a player, whether it be due to poor performance or other reasons? That is a great question. And what is it like to deal with player transfers? Um, dropping players, just like like if you need to part ways with, with any member of the Complexity family, is one of the worst parts of the job. We try, and it, as you can imagine, it's an emotionally volatile thing, right? We, we've tried for 20 years to do our very best by players. Um, when it's their time to go. We try our very best to have a conversation face-to-face. -face. If, if we can't, we try to have a call. We never want our players to find out they got cut over social media. Sometimes there's a lot of pressing concerns where there's announcements and rosters um, that are due for leagues and tournaments. And But it, it, we just try to be a people-first organization. And we try when we need to release players to do so in the most humanly compassionate way as possible. Are we going to get it right every time? Of course not. Are people going to be angry at us and hate us or whatever? It's like, of course they are. It's, it's the business that, that we're in. Um, but yeah, it, it's a difficult thing to cut players. We just try to do so in a way that respects them and it is uh, done in a, in a human manner to the best of our ability every single time. Huge shout out to Katie. That's right, fantastic. All right. Smokey, if you make it down to here, had a random question. What did you learn from the first go at a team house before it was really a common thing? We did have the America's first team house, 2005, I think. Um, and how do we apply that to managing player relationships, work schedules? Great question. I joke all the time when I do the tour of our headquarters. Well, one thing we learned about team houses is the, the teams get better much faster, but they implode much faster because it's not healthy living with your coworkers. <laughs> they want to strangle each other after a few months, which is totally reasonable. You know, you're not meant, we're not meant to live with our coworkers like for months and months and months on end. Um, and that's part of why we developed eSports 3.0, where they each have their own apartment in Frisco, and they come to work and, and have the, a line between their private life and, and their uh, work life. And it is difficult on mental health. Yep, that's what we've learned about team houses. They, they can be beneficial, but they can be very problematic. Willie Wood, hey, yeah. I like, I like Ray Dalio's book. Okay, final question that I skipped. Sorry. Thanks, Scott Cole. Frogman, one thing I've always admired about complexity compared to other NA orgs that you have always been dedicated to the core of the team being primarily American Canadian, with the exception of the Blame F config era. Will this continue to be a priority moving forward, or will victory be priority number one? I think that um, obviously we're an American organization and loyal to North America, but we appreciate our fans from all parts of the world um, just as much as our American fans. That's just the truth. Like we love being from this region and we do our very best to represent this region, but we're happy to work with players from South America or China or Korea or Europe or whatever, name a place. 
Um, now for team games, as you've seen historically, we do our best to represent our region like we are with Counter-Strike right now. Um, and whatever we have kind of good options in North America, I think will always favor North America for these team-based games so our players can represent our region and, and take on the rest of the world. But we're also not going to be boxed into a corner, whereas if we go pick up a, a team from the Philippines or name a place, right? It's like, hey, we believe in this team. We think they're really good people. We want them to be part of our gaming family. People are like, whoa, they're not American. It's like, we're a global brand. We want to continue to expand globally when given the right opportunities. We want to contribute to global communities that might even be underserved. So while certainly being loyal to America and wanting to represent our region, um, we're not, we're not going to be put in a box and be like, oh, they're American only. That's that's not who complexity is. It's not really who complexity has ever been. All right. I think that's probably good. Uh, hey, bro, Dania. If I could name one thing you wish the tournament organizer would do differently, benefit to the players at esports orgs, what would it be? Um, tournament organizers have come a really long ways in recent years. <laughs> From like a dozen players in one hotel room <laughs> to uh, individual hotel rooms, much better, better travel support. Um, tournament organizers have, have come a long way. Um, food at events. Teams and players and organizers have worked together. It's, of course, it's not perfect. Um, it's a global business. There's a lot of moving parts, but I would like to give props to the main tournament organizers. They've, they've definitely come a long way. If I could put one thing on a wish list, I wish they could get airline sponsorships and everyone could fly like in business class and things just to help offset the jet lag and how difficult it is constantly traveling. But airlines haven't been really uh, eager to sponsor um, in esports, unfortunately. So I think uh, that's probably enough for today. And I want to thank everyone, especially all of you that sat through this long um, fireside chat. And I want to do this more often. Um, I know people don't want to listen to me ramble an hour a month or anything like that. But if we have any notable news or whatever, I'm going to try to find time like I did after the acquisition to just be like, hey, we're getting together today. today. Um, and I'll try to hop in as everyone in Complexity will into the Discord and field your questions as we can. So invite your friends and feel free to just make this your community. We have the games listed out on the left. If you have one game, like if you're really hardcore Halo and don't care so much about the other games, we get it. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Smokey. Um, yeah, we just want you to hang out with us and we want your help, please, in really rebuilding a strong community vibe. Um, if I have any regrets about the last six years since we've really... It hasn't been that we haven't worked hard enough. It hasn't been that we haven't done some cool things and worked with some great gamers and produced some great content. My biggest regret in the last six years since we got to Texas is we haven't focused enough on community and building a community um, that's really worth you investing your time. And we want to be an organization that you want to cheer for and you want to be a part of and you want to take. 10, 15 minutes out of your day to come say what's up at Discord and and tweet at us and or whatever. And we're going to do our very, very best to earn your support and to give you a community that you want to hang out in. So thank you very much uh, for joining us today, everybody. And uh, like I said, I'm, I promise I'm going to try to do more of these. Like I said on my Twitter, um, I'm going to really try to do a better job of just vlogging a little bit more. Um, a lot of what I do is so damn boring. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Nine meetings today. Like, what am I going to vlog about that? Most of them are confidential, or it wouldn't be appropriate to share. But when I go to events and when I do these different things, I'm going to try to be more transparent. I'm going to try to share with you guys in our community what I'm thinking and what the organization is like planning and kind of what we're up to. I think you'll find that we we always try to do our best to be professional and do our business with integrity, which means a lot of times there's non-disclosure agreements and we have confidentiality um, with players and things that we can't share everything. But for the things that we can share, we're going to be one of the most transparent organizations you've ever seen. Like I, I'm out here sharing what the CS event is going to cost and the fact that we don't have a lead sponsor for it yet. I think I've shared a lot 
in the last hour that other esports CEOs never, never would go there. And you're going to continue to see more of that. Um, that's the way we want to move things forward. And uh, is it going to bite me in particular and in the backside from time to time? Absolutely. I'd, I'd rather be transparent with our community and, and really do all of this together and, and build something really cool together. And maybe I share too much from time to time, then try to be some corporate grifter, fake PR nonsense BS, right? Um, so I think you're going to see a lot more transparency from me and from the people that make complexity work. And we just want to say thank you very much for joining today. And thank you very much for hanging out in our in our Discord and supporting our gaming family, which you are a part of. Thank you very much, guys. I appreciate it.